Okay. Well, um, we'll continue our journey through the assignments, looking at each of them, going through the exam an example from Second Timothy for them, just to, to again remind us of the, the procedure. So today, my plan, my desire is to to look at continue the next part of assignment. Uh, 513, number 13, which had two parts to it. Um, assignment 513 had, the first part was the textual observations, which we covered last week, we reviewed there. And then today, I'll, I just want to briefly look at the word studies, just remind us of a few key points there as part of that assignment. And then we'll move to the next assignment, assignment number 14, which, um, is the what we call the primary matter. So we'll, we'll cover a little bit of that this week, Lord willing, and then hopefully finish next week. Because next week will be our last uh, Zoom class together that I will be leading. Um, then it will transition in September to Pastor Marvin. He'll be taking over for September and October, going through some uh, discipleship, mentoring, uh, leadership principles from Christ. I think it'll be really good. And so uh, please, please make sure to, to give time to that. I know you'll be blessed um, as we were last time when he, when he taught us uh, several helpful principles on leadership. So uh, that's the plan, Lord willing. So we'll meet uh, this morning and then next week, and then we'll transition to Pastor Marvin. And then after the end of October, it'll be close to our module six together. So it's coming, getting closer, guys. We're about uh, a little less than two and a half months away. So just keep that in mind uh, regarding your assignments that need to get done. So make sure to get on that. Keep keep pressing forward on that as well. But let's go into assignment number 13 from module five and looking at word studies. Uh, again, here is a, a overview of what we have covered together in the various sessions that we have covered the different assignments just as a point of reference for you and so last week in session session 11 we covered the textual observation and then today we're going to cover the significant words or the word studies for for this um module five okay so with that That'll be for assignment 13. And then again, assignment 14 will moving towards the exegetical and homiletical idea, which we'll cover in a little bit. So, so for this morning right now, I want to talk about significant words of the passage and just remind us again, this is by way of review. We've done this several times before, but I have noticed sometimes a few things that uh, when you guys have, have done this assignment before, um, a couple of things that have been left out. So I just want to make sure you're clear on what when we talk about doing a word study, what does that involve? What does that include? And again, we're studying words in their original language, of course. We're looking at the Greek or Hebrew, depending on the text. And of course, Second Timothy, we're going to be, you want to look up the particular Greek word. And so there are several uh, uh, ways to identify what words are significant. And if you remember... Uh, these different ways. We want to look for words that are connected to the theme, and that should say passage, the theme of the passage. We want to look for particular words that um, are especially the verbs, and especially verbs in the main sentence of the paragraph. Uh, verbs are what drive uh, the, the action of the text. Uh, repeated words can also be uh, important and helpful to look up. And then uh, also, too, if you just see a word that doesn't make sense, you don't understand, uh, it's unclear, uh, look that up. Uh, it's helpful to compare translations and look for words that maybe the translations have done differently. That tells you that the translations aren't confident. And you'll see that. Usually there'll be one or two words in a passage that, that are translated differently. Those would be helpful to, to look up. And then words that are figurative, look words that have theological significance. So those are just some different principles or guides for us in looking for significant words in a passage. But honestly, I mean, you can you can do a word study on any word that you want. I mean, there's no restriction. It just it can take some time. So you want to choose your words carefully 
just for the sake of being efficient. You want to choose those words that are really going to help you better understand the passage, not just any word in the text. Um, but you're, you're welcome to do a word study on every single word if you want. It'll just, you know, take you half a week to get done. So um, I am not, I don't do that many word studies myself. Um, I have found that if I understand the context well, if I've done all the other steps up to this one and I've been um, diligent in those steps, that typically there's not that many words that I found that I need to look at. Um, uh, definitely still do some word studies. I, I don't ignore it, but, but because the context is ultimately going to decide the meaning of a word, the better I understand the context then the better I'm going to understand that word being used in the context. And so context is your guide in this. But sometimes there are particularly challenging words. There are repeated words, again, can be important. And so doing a word study may offer additional insights into that particular word. And I found word studies also, sometimes as I look at like what the word originally meant and then how the meaning changed over time, sometimes that can be helpful in like if I'm going to, illustrate the meaning of a word in the sermon or something like that. So that can be a useful and helpful thing. So those would be the, the how to identify significant words. Once you've identified a particular word that you want to do a word study on, the first thing you want to do is find the lexical definition. That is, what's the dictionary definition for the word uh, in its original language? And so for that, we have used, uh, you know, Bible Hub, Blue Letter, Bible.org. Uh, there's a few good online websites, you know, Bible Hub. Again, if you remember, you can go to the interlinear and then uh, hit the Strong's number. We'll do an example in a little bit, uh, but you guys should remember that. So go to that and then you'll get sort of basic definition um, at BibleHub.com on the online resource. It'll give you just a simple definition. So first, identify that. And then look for how that word is translated in other English translations. I can also do, you know, look up the word in the Tagalog or Sobano translation and see how the word's translated there just to give you some ideas and how it's how different translators have looked at it. And then identify how the word, that same Greek or Hebrew word, how it's used in other passages. Now, in some case, some cases, um, Oh, I've got to change this a little bit here. I didn't uh, modify this like I needed to. So if you have a word that's got lots of uses, like say there's 30 different passages it's used in, you want to try to reduce that to 10. So what I would do is if you have a word that's used a lot, uh, look for words, look for how uh, the, the verses that it's used in from within the same book you're studying. And um, if, if it's in another uh, epistle, then look for words that are in a, and then look for how the words used in the New Testament elsewhere and in the Old. But so you may, for example, have a word that's used 30 times and you find 10 uses uh, within the same book and in other epistles. And I'd say, well, OK, stop there. That's good enough. You're just trying to get a, a, a feel and understanding of how the word might be used in other places. All right. And then I would encourage you to try to examine other outside resources like Vines. You can get Vines Dictionary online for the Greek words. Um, there is usually some other uh, dictionary definitions in BibleHub.com or Blue Letter Bible that you can use. And then here's the most important one. And this is one that I've noticed uh, people often forget. Uh, some of you guys have from time to time. Make sure you give a summary of the meaning of the word. I mean, that's the whole point that you're doing this exercise for. You're, you're trying to find what does this word mean here? So after you've done uh, these previous steps, now in the last step, just summarize what the word means in your own words, in the context of the passage, all right? So that that's important. That's what you're trying to get to, is what how that word's being used. So let me, uh, let's do for 2 Timothy 1, uh, six through eight. This is the passage we've been looking at the last few sessions just to go through some examples with it. So I'd like you to uh, let's read. We'll read the text and then let's let's see if we can identify uh, some of the words that might be helpful to do a word study on. So uh, I'm going to ask if uh, 
Benedio, if you could read this for us, if, you're, if your audio is working okay, read 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 8 for us, please. Still muted, huh? Are you able to unmute? Uh, say, okay, can you hear me, sir? Yes. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Therefore, do not assume of the, either the witness about our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. All right, thank you. So what I'd like to do is have each of you just pick a word that you think is important or significant to study and just tell us why, why you think that word would be good to study. So... Uh, James, let me start with you. Just as you look at this passage, what's what's one word that sticks out to you that you think would be helpful to study and why? Would it be possible to kindle afresh? Yeah, kindle afresh. And why do you think that would be a helpful word to, to study? Well, it's important to refresh, to refresh. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a key word in the passage, right? It's part of Paul's main instruction. Um, and it's not maybe the meaning's a little unclear. What does it mean to kindle afresh? Because kindle is used often for burning. So is that the idea or what's 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 this uh, idea here? So that that's a good word to consider. Okay, great. Uh, Alan, how about you? What's a word you might pick and why? Uh, the same. Kindle afresh. And the next one is the gift. Okay, why Why the gift? Uh, what would be a reason you see that as important to study? Uh, uh, because of the command to kindle it afresh so uh, maybe to consider which gift uh, Timothy had in particular okay good all right Kazot how about you what's a word that you might pick from this passage For this passage, Pastor Tim, is uh, the laying out, the laying on of my hands. Okay, so laying on would be, uh, and why, why would that be a helpful word to study? What, what does this means, Pastor Tim, when Paul says that uh, for the gift of God, which is true which in you through the laying on of my hands. Okay. Or figurative. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh... Because it is a, a, a gerund, Pastor Tim, huh? Yes, it is a gerund, so it's a noun. All right, good. How about you, Alex? What word would you pick from this? Uh, uh, it's, uh, actually, it's quite, uh, for me, it's quite intriguing because uh, I've heard from uh, others that uh, they're using this this uh, phrase and just uh, uh, change the 
change some words. So I'd say a spirit of timidity. And uh, other other religions are exchanging words like uh, spirit of sleepiness, spirit of other, calling other spirits, spirit of sickness, spirit of... So maybe uh, it needs uh, more expounding so that uh, be able to understand more of this uh, this uh, phrase. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Rio, how about you? What's another okay. word you might consider important to study here? I think, sir. Suffering. Okay. And why would you uh, choose that word? Uh, what kind of suffering Paul is referring to? Okay. All right. Good. Yeah, those would be some words that we might want to add. Uh, ashamed of, since it's a command, it's a, it's yeah. a key verb. Uh, maybe the join, join with me, or join is another command. What's that? The witness, the witness about our Lord. What does it mean? What kind of witness? Or oh yeah, mean? so witness. Okay, so there's several that are that are key here. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna choose the word remind. Just for our study, all these are good words to do. I'm going to choose the word remind just because it's the key instruction in the text. It's the first verb. Um, and, you know, I think I know what remind means, but because it's it's the part of the key instruction, you know, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift. I think that <clears throat> the words in that phrase would be helpful to, to understand. And so I would, again, I'm not saying these other words are not important or not. I'm just saying I want to pick one just for the sake of, of an example. So I'm going to do remind. And uh, so the first thing we want to do, as you guys know, is is we'll look up on Bible Hub. We want to look up the, the definition from there. So I'll do that real quick. Let's do this. All right. So we've got Bible Hub here. We're going to go to 2 Timothy. All right, 2 Timothy 1, and do interlin. I'm going to get the chapter, and that was, I think, in verse 6. All right, so if I'm looking here, uh, here's the word remind. Anamnesco. Anamnesco. And uh, up here, that 363, that is, again, the Strong's number. And that's going to give me all that information that we're going to want for for this particular to do the word study. So here we've got, and this is what I'm talking about. Here's a basic definition. All right. To remind, to call the one's remembrance. Well, that doesn't add a whole lot of information, but it's a basic. And then there's below it here, again, to recollect by going through a process. Okay. Well, that's a little more detail, so that's helpful. So these are the things I would note on my uh, here. So Bible from Bible Hub to bring to mind a call to remembrance. Um, what was the other thing we saw there? Uh, it says to to recollect by going through a process. Okay, so. So those are just, I would just take a few notes. This is just getting initial initial idea. Again, uh, then there's the Thayer's Greek lexicon, which is uh, just a Greek dictionary. Lexicon just means dictionary. And notice it gives several. The call to remembrance, to remind, to admonish, to remember, to remember and weigh well, to consider. So I would put those down on my list here. Call to remember, admonish. So I just list those out from Thayer's, and then the Strong's Concordance also gives basic definition: to recollect, call to mind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
So then I would put those down as well. All right. So when we're talking about lexical definitions. It's just looking for some of the basic dictionary definitions that the range of options that the word could mean. Again, remember, when we talk about definitions, dictionary definitions, this is true for most words in most languages. You know, when you look up the word in a dictionary, typically you'll have a few different possible meanings, right? Um, usually there'll be a, a range. And then sometimes certain words may have a number of different meanings. Um, so it's helpful to at least list out what are the options. Now, again, that doesn't mean, okay, now I'm going to choose from the list the one I like. No, it's just here's the list. So that, that gives me the range of the different kinds of meanings um, that I should just be aware of as I'm studying this word. So those dictionary definitions aren't the end of my study. All right. I want to know the meaning of the word in the context. But the dictionary gives me the options, the possibilities. But we're not done yet. Okay, so the next step we want to do then is go from the different um, basic definitions. Then, okay, how is the word translated in other English translations? And like I said, you could also add Subano, Tagalog into this. Um, but what's interesting is noticing pretty much it's the same. I looked up six different English translations, two or sorry, eight. Uh, two older ones, the ASV and the King James, and then six newer ones. And all the new ones have remind, and the two old ones have put you in remembrance. So <laughs> um, not much not much uh, range of ideas there. It seems like pretty much all the translators have zeroed in on one particular idea. So that might make this word study a little bit easier. And then what I want to do is, okay, well, let me see how is the word used in other passages. And for that, again, I can go to my Bible hub and every usage, every other verse usage is given here. And what I can do is go to where it says occurrences here. So you'll have a, they list a few verses that it occurs in. Um, and notice it says six occurrences. So you can press that and then you'll get usually all the occurrences. So here, uh, one, two, three, four. So this is all, there's only six usages of this specific word in the New Testament. Two in Mark, one in 1 Corinthians, second, one in 2 Corinthians, the one in 2 Timothy, and one in Hebrew. So it's only used once by Paul in 2 Timothy. It's also used by Paul in 1 and 2 Corinthians. And then we find it in Mark's Gospel twice and in Hebrews. So only six words. And then as so what I do then is I just look up those particular passages. All right. And I've got them here. And I just highlight the word, how it's translated. Um, so then you just look through the different translations there. And essentially it's the same meaning in each of these passages. This idea of bringing to mind, recalling, and even uh, that process of reminding myself or, or reminding yourself. All right. So again, basic meaning. There's nothing real deep here. Uh, this is a pretty simple word. Examine other resources. I looked up uh, one resource. This is a brown driver. Um, I can't remember. Arndt and Gingrich, I think. You can also look up the dictionary definition of the English word remind. And nothing new here. Okay. Same idea that we've been studying. So basically, after taking all that into account, this word's pretty easy. Sometimes it's not so easy, but this word's pretty easy. The focus of this word is to recollect. These are my this is my own words. To recollect or remember or bring something back to mind what was previously known. And then I noted that this word actually is made up of two Greek words that have been brought together. Um, let's see. Yeah, Strong's noted this. It comes from two Greek words, ana and minesco. Minesco means to remind. Ana means again or back. So this idea of reminding myself again. 
so it's not just remind or remember, but it's it, that preposition ana or again was added onto it. And so because of that, I said the addition of this preposition further emphasizes the idea of recollection, to recall again, to remember again. So it's this idea of repetition. So that's a helpful insight into the word. It's not just remember, but it's keep remembering. Remember again and again. So, so Paul is telling Timothy to remember again, and I probably maybe I should put and again, <laughs> to kindle the gift of God in him. This suggests Paul has told him this before and is now reminding him once again to do that. Okay. So, like I said, don't forget this last, last part of the process. Summarize the meaning of the word. So just talk it out. You know, write it, write a few sentences in your own words of what this verse means. And notice I put here in 2 Timothy 1 6. So I identify how Paul's using it in this passage. Paul uses that word telling Timothy to remember again and again to kindle the gift of God. Um I probably should say given to him. Okay. So that's that's the process I want I want you to, to follow when you go through this particular assignment. All right. Now it should be by way of review, but are there any any questions that you guys have just going through that again? Hopefully that makes sense. Uh I think me... I forgot that Pastor Tim. I oh, forgot that, yeah. some the, the the mean the, the sense of it, I think in John. Yes. Yeah, I think that was yeah, you were the latest one I had to remind <laughs> of each of the steps, but that's okay. That's why we're doing this review because some of these things we haven't talked about in a while. And I just wanna you know, as we've gone through this process over four and a half years now or four years, there's some things that I know we've maybe forgotten or didn't remember everything. So I'm I'm just bringing I'm reminding you again of of the steps just to to help help with that. And so here's the 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 assignment that, um, you know, I've that you find on Canvas. And again, do this it's for your assigned passage, the textual observations, which we did covered last week. And then the second part of this assignment is the word study. And then for the word study, notice I say do the word study on three significant words. Normally I ask for five, but um, uh, three significant words in the passage. You can do it on more. I would encourage you to do more for your preparation for your sermon but for this assignment i'm just asking you to do three and make sure to do the the steps that we just discussed in um in the text or in the uh, assignment okay and then i put what we just covered from second timothy one i put an example the example we covered together i just put that in the assignment so you have this example and you can uh, go through this again as a reminder. And then what I did is I just put space for you to do each this assignment. So the textual observations or verbs, pronouns, etc. And then the word study, I just left a blank page for you. But do those six steps. And of course, you can go use more than one page if you need it. But I just put it here for, for a template for you. Okay. Again, three significant words in the passage. Your assigned passage. And I'll just put that, your signed passage. Okay? I'll make that more clear. All right. So that's it for word study. Comments or questions on that? That's assignment 
number 13 of module 5. Okay, good. All right, well, let's move then to assignment 14. And we're just going to start on that. There's a few, uh, I call it the primary matters, but what it is basically is the the remaining steps from um, after doing the word study all the way to the exegetical idea to homiletical idea. So uh, let me... Pull up our notes here. So basically, uh, assignment. So this is assignment number five, fourteen. In fact, let me just pull that assignment up. I think that would help. Okay. So that assignment given here, five fourteen. Call it primary matters for Second Timothy. And this assignment you'll complete. Uh, steps 7 through 11 in the uh, process for 2 Timothy, which is these five thing items. So consult resources for your assigned passage. Then identify the exegetical idea of your passage. Identify the timeless truths. Uh, do the, the meditation step. Spend at least 30 minutes reflecting on the passage and then write a paragraph, and then create the homiletical idea. So those are the steps that um, are included in this assignment. So this morning, we'll probably just cover resources, and maybe we'll get to the exegetical idea, and then we'll review the rest of these next week. Okay? So with that, let's just remember, again, resources. I think we're you know familiar with this, but Again, this, we're doing this by way of review just to make sure we uh, remember we're in that step after doing the word study. Then you're ready now. Now that you've done all this work in the first six steps, you're now familiar enough with the passage that you can begin to engage with, with the resources. And as we've talked about before, uh, we wait till this point before doing a heavy research of the resources, because the more you've studied the text, the more you understand the passage, the more work you've put in, the the resources, the use of resources will be a lot more efficient, because it most things won't be new to you, or at least maybe you've thought about it, or you know the passage well enough that, that the different things that the resources bring up, you'll at least have some familiarity with the text. If you don't study the text first and begin looking at resources, everything will be new. So it's going to be a very inefficient way to use resources because you have to read everything and think about everything each resource has written. As opposed to if you've done the work, resources then can be used much more quickly. Uh, I've seen this in my own studies. And of course, again, resources would be, you know, commentaries, sermons, um, Encyclopedia articles, uh, you know, online uh, sources, con um, you, you know, word studies would be part of that as well, using resources. So variety of resources that we can use. But I think the best way to do this, one, so that, that you aren't influenced too early by a resource, but but also too that you'll be able to use the resource better is if you wait. Wait till this step. After you've done all this study of the book as a whole, the diagramming, the observa textual observations, the, the word studies, you're going to be very familiar with the passage, and I think you'll find the resources will be much more helpful to you. Uh, so that said, As we look at these resources, as we consult these resources, consider that, um, yeah, theology books, also journal articles. Uh, here are some helpful resources for 2 Timothy. These aren't the only ones, but these are ones that, that I found helpful. There's many others, but just to give you an example, um, here's a few commentaries. You may or may not have access to those. I'll talk about online resources in a minute. But you have these 
these particular commentaries, these are some well-known commentaries on the pastoral epistles from John MacArthur, Gordon Fee, J. D. Kelly, uh, Bill Mounts. And then the Zondervan Encyclopedia has some helpful articles on Timothy, some background to him, and then on the pastoral epistles. Again, there's many other commentaries that, that are helpful. These are just a few. Um, but the online resources, which are free and more easily uh, accessible, would be the these. Um, I think a uh, really, really helpful resource, I think I've shown this one to you before, is the sermons from Grace Community Church. So if you go to gracechurch.org and just hit sermons, you can see this at the top of the middle of your screen, hit sermons. These are, Grace Church has recorded messages from not only the pulpit, Pastor John's pulpit, but all the different fellowship groups in the church. And they have, you know, a number of excellent teachers there, uh, pa other pastors and elders who teach. And so if you hit sermons here, these are recordings of all of the other sermons. So you'll have some John MacArthur sermons, of course. But then over here, you scroll down under sermon search. You can just look up. OK, I want to look up Second Timothy. What are some sermons preached at Grace? For 2 Timothy. Let's say I'm doing 2 Timothy 1, right? My passage, 6 through 9. So I'm going to do a search. And now they've pulled up. You can even get some in Spanish if you want. Anybody speak Spanish well enough? We could uh, listen to a sermon in Spanish. But then they've got... Um, uh, so I'm looking for my passage. So don't be ashamed of the gospel. That David Caldwell... Uh, Pastor John did an overview of 2 Timothy 1 and 2 in a, in a conference. Um, here's one. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for verses 6. Here's an overview. That's from a lady. Tim Peters did an overview of suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And again, you can just go through. Phil Johnson did some messages. Sinclair Ferguson did one. Rekindling the flame. All right. So. You'll see a bunch of sermons here on on uh, that will connect to your passage. So that's, this is a very helpful resource. So gracechurch.org, and then hit sermons. And then you can do a search. Okay? Now, if you want Pastor John's sermons, you can just hit that box, of course, and then look up, look up his messages on Timothy. Or you can go to gracetoyou.org. It's a little easier to use and hit sermons here. And then you can go by scripture and then go to Second Timothy. And it's got the sermons here. So Second Timothy 1, there's a 6 through 9. I've got two messages from those that I can use. All right. So that's one resource. Another resource that um, that I find helpful is I look up, um, let's see, uh, Steve Lawson's sermons. You can go to, you know, onepassion.org and you can find Steve Lawson's sermons here. He's usually, he's done most books, at least some, so you can do uh, look up sermons and then go to here sermon audio and do a search for um sorry under so scripture so you can do second timothy sort by newest all right and then i'll just hit here and so now i've got his sermons from second timothy so i can look through here and see if there's any on verse ah here's uh one from second timothy one one to seven and then another one uh, from eight to ten OK. And I know you, you guys can do this. So I put a few Tom Constable's notes, very helpful resource. Um, Bible Hub has a few commentaries on Second Timothy, some older ones. The Gospel Coalition, there's a commentary on Second Timothy or Study Light. So these will be in your notes, but these are some resources you can use online. For because the thing you want to be careful of, of course, right, is. You can go online and like 
go to, you know, do Second Timothy sermons from Second Timothy and you'll get a bunch of hits, right? But how do you know which one of those is going to be reliable and helpful? Because you don't want to listen to 10 sermons. That's going to take you, you know, eight, 10 hours. And then you might realize, oh, these these four were really bad. They didn't help me at all, you know. But so I, I choose those certain resources because I know the teachers are solid and it'll be helpful. So the Grace Church one, you know, it's not just John MacArthur, but you'll, there's a number of different excellent teachers there and you, you can know they're they're reliable and solid so that's a good a good resource that i like to use um i also look at spurgeon sermons too uh, he's not as exegetical but he's got lots of great illustrations very christ-centered very gospel oriented so usually i get a lot of helpful statements or illustrations or uh, gospel focus from from spurgeon so any comments or questions about that? Okay. So again, I'll I'll have uh, those resources I'll put in your notes that I post for you from this session today so you can and take a look at those in more detail, all right? Okay. Well, with that, then let's... Let's talk about briefly, how do we use the resources? Um, you know, that, well, that might sound like an obvious question. Well, I'm just going to, you know, I'll just look it up. And, uh, you know, just read the resource. Well, yeah. Yeah. But I just wanted to remind us of a couple of things first before we, we do that. Um, one thing that I'd like to remind us of is when you when you look at the resources, uh, using them is more than just reading through them or just listening to the sermon or the audio resource. You really need to, at this stage, guys, you need to be able to organize your thoughts, the things that you get from these resources, don't just cut and paste, you know, paragraphs and then move on. You have to be thoughtful as you look at the resource. What actually is helpful? Um, you're not looking for things just to copy and then, you know, put in your sermon notes. Um, you want to look for statements or insights that help you understand the passage better. That's why I put thoughtful approach. It, it helps you. Um, you know, they should help you understand, you help you understand the passage better. Okay, it's not just, you know, finding comments made by other authors or, or preachers that sound good and you just want to put in your sermon. Because really, ultimately, you want to you wanna understand the passage well so that, that you, as you communicate to your hearers that you know well, John MacArthur doesn't know your congregation. He doesn't know your hearers. I mean, he has general idea, you know, Christians in general, and maybe, you know, but but you know your congregation. You know your audience, and you know what was going to be most helpful for them. So as you understand the passage, you'll be better able to, um, you know, better able to, to apply it to them, to to help them understand, so they know how how to apply it in their own lives. All right, so that that's what's what's important. You know, we often look at resources as kind of like uh, you know, this is just you know gonna help me make my sermon, or you know, um, and ultimately, I guess that's true, but really, it's to help you understand your passage. Um, and maybe at times like sermons can be great resources to help us know how to illustrate a point better. Or, you know, sometimes the way something is uh, said or written can be helpful. But so use these resources thoughtfully. OK. That's important. And so I suggest that this 
this process to do that. So of course, the first step, read through the resource and then identify helpful comments. And what I do is if I have a resource, if I'm reading something, I'll just underline or highlight or circle or put a star or a check mark next to just as a, so as I, I just read through and I say, oh, that that's helpful. That's interesting. And I'll just check it. I don't stop. I don't copy it. I don't, because I want to keep reading. So I, I'll just identify, um, as I said, I would suggest reading through all of the resource first. Let me put that. You know, noting what is helpful um, information there. Read through it first and then go to the next step of documenting. So again, just going through and just highlighting or marking those those statements that are made that you find helpful. And then after you've read through the whole resource, then you can go back and incorporate those helpful remarks into your um your, your document with with the information. I'll show you this when we do an example from 2 Timothy. So what I mean by this is, guys, to, uh, I think if you read through the whole resource, sometimes the author will repeat himself or sometimes he'll come back to a point and say something else. And so if you're like, see something, you stop, you, you copy it on or cut and paste it or whatever, then you go back, start reading it and stop cut and paste, read, stop, read, stop. It's, I don't think that's helpful in following the author's flow. I think it'll take longer than it. Just read through and, you know, make a little note next to those helpful remarks and then come back and just look for the places that you noted. And after you've read through the whole thing, you'll better understand the context of the resource. Okay. And so, but if you keep starting, stopping, starting, stopping, I think that will make it less efficient. So I'm just, this isn't a rule. You can do this however you want, guys. I'm just trying to give you some helpful hints, at least that were helpful for me. Because I want, we don't have a lot of time, right? You don't have 60 hours a week to prepare for the message, right? I'm assuming. <laughs> you know, maybe if you get 20, that's that's really good. But even that's probably more than then you probably have time for. So, but you want to use resources, right? They're going to be helpful, but you don't want to give, if you only have, you know, 16 hours this week to prepare, you don't want to spend 10 of them on resources, right? Otherwise you're just going to be cutting, pasting. It won't be good. So you need to learn how to use resources efficiently. And so I'm just trying to give you some, ways that I think can help you do that. First, do your own study. That'll help you be efficient. And then secondly, as you read through the resource, um, make, make uh, you know, just little check marks. Or if you're listening to a sermon, what I would do is, as you hear something that was helpful, just write down the, the time in the message. So, okay, 10 minutes and 12 seconds. He said something helpful. I'll come back to it and type it up you know once in a while i'll stop the sermon and type it up if i think that's really helpful but again i like to listen to the whole sermon and then i'll just make a note of where those helpful insights are then i can go back and because you might find too as you re go through the whole sermon that that some of the those statements may not be that helpful or as you read through the whole resource you may realize at the end you know this this part wasn't really that insightful so i'm not going to copy it um so again efficiency is what i'm trying to help you with here does that make sense you guys have any questions on that what are you thinking is this uh helpful maybe you already i mean you may probably already have your own system down but i'm just want to give you some other things to think about to make you more efficient and in your study. Any comments or questions, thoughts? All right, let me show you an example. Alan, did you have something? 
I just remember uh, Vincent Green in our module one study. That was uh, a long time ago. <laughs> yes, that's a long time ago. And it's really helpful in pointing those things out. Uh, you have to collect all the ideas and think through them and then make your own conclusion and write them down. Yeah, yeah, he had some good. Yeah. I'm, I'm really just sort of reminding us of some of the things he brought up, um, you know, back in module one when we went through this. Let me show you an example from Second Timothy. I'll just do this quickly just to um, help us a little bit with the, seeing that. So again, we'll use the same example. And this is what I did. And this is just a, a, in, in part. This is not a whole. But what I typically do is I'll, I'll have a in my document, you know, where I've, where I've put all the information for all the steps, you know, all the assignments you're doing, I make into one document. So I have a I have a my own exegetical document where I'll put in the my my observations from reading the book, the background of the book, the con the contextual flow of the book, my block diagram of my passage. So I put all this in a document. And then when I get to this step with resources, I set it up where I do verse by verse. So I'll have verse six, for example, if I'm doing Second Timothy one, six to nine, I'll have verse six. And then what I do in this step for resources is I'll put in helpful comments from different resources. So Tom Constable's notes. I put in something that I thought was helpful from verse 6 on the uh, Kindle Afresh, the gift. And then the, the Gospel Coalition commentary from Paul Gione. I, I put in something he said. Uh, Bill Mounts from his commentary, the MacArthur commentary, the laying on of hands, he had a comment about. Then verse, this, so I'll collect all the things under verse six. Usually I'll connect it phrase by phrase. So that way I've got everything organized. So all everything that's related to, you know, for example, in verse six, I might have, um, this would be what the, uh, uh, the gift the gift of God. So I might have that, and then I'll have Tom Constable's comments under that. Um, and Paul Gione had a comment under that. Okay, and then um, Bill Mount said spiritual gift. So all of these would be related to that comment, gift of God. Now this one is laying on of my hands. So this is another uh, clause in there so i put this the macarthur con so i organize it that way so now everything so then i can do is as i'm as i'm thinking about um how i'm explaining this in the sermon i've got all of the notes all the comments for every phrase or clause put together do the same thing for verse seven all right the spirit of and tom constable had a comment um, Bill Mounts had a comment about that. And then, uh, then a question I had about, is it human spirit or Holy Spirit? And Mount, so, so this is just an example. I organize each verse and then each clause and phrase under the verse and put my notes together and collect them. So they're, they're all in one place. Okay. And then if I had something from sermon, sermon comments for each of these, I put those in here. But I'm just showing you a few just to give you an example. All right. So this is how I organize my thoughts in this step. Now, in your, for the assignment here, so does that make sense how I'm doing this? I think I've shown this to you before, but I just wanted to remind you that makes sense how I'm organizing things. Yes, Pastor Dean. Okay. So you again, you guys don't have to do it this way. Uh, if you have your own system that you find helpful, I'm just showing you how I do it. And this is the way that's helped me organize my thoughts so that, because later on you'll have all this information. And as you're putting the sermon together and you're trying to explain something, I, you know, let's say you're now explaining. 
So as we look at this text, and Paul indicates that God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline, what kind of spirit is he talking about? Is that an attitude, a human spirit, or is he talking about the Holy Spirit? And so then that that issue, I can look at my notes under spirit and just see, you know, all the information that I collected there. And I that'll help me as I'm putting together my discussion in the sermon. And then I might even throw in a quote, you know, as as Bill Mount said, um, it seems to be that the it's the humans, uh, the, this idea of an attitude, a human attitude, because and then I can explain it. All right. But if if I haven't organized my thoughts and I, you know, I remember, oh, I think I remember Bill Mount said something about it. And John MacArthur had a comment, too. And, oh, but, you know, if they're if all those thoughts are scattered, if you haven't collected them in one place, it makes it again, we want to be efficient. <laughs> so just looking for ways to help us be more efficient in our study. So if you put all the notes about one particular uh, statement or phrase, you could put your word study notes in there. Under verse 7, under spirit, if that was a word that you did a word study on. So you can put everything in one place so that um, so that it's all there. Because a lot of times I've noticed, especially if I study over the course of a week. So if I study a little on Monday and then study some more on Wednesday and study some on Friday. Um, if I don't have things organized, I could forget or misplace, you know, things that I've already studied. All right. So if you're spread out your study over and sometimes you might spread it out over two weeks. Right. Um, or longer, depending on the situation. But you can easily forget things or lose things. So I suggest this as a method to to keep things organized, put it under verse by verse and then collect it even under the phrase or the clause, each phrase and clause in that verse. All right. Any thoughts or questions? Okay, so for example, though, now in the assignment, uh, this is what, I, I don't ask you to put all these notes in the assignment, otherwise it could be too long. So for the assignment, all I'm asking you to do is to note what resources you used, okay? So for example, Consult resources. Uh, these are the resources I consulted for my study of the passage and then just put them in here. All right. So you don't have to put all that other stuff for the assignment. This is an example from Philemon that I use here. I'll put the second Timothy one in here. But so for the assignment, all you need to put is the resources that you use. But. For your actual use of resources, you should be, uh, don't just put down the resources you use, but actually put in those particular comments and thoughts under each verse. You know, this would be for your own notes. Okay. For the assignment, just give me the resources you use. For your own notes, I would collect them and organize them in, in a fashion like this in order that they can be helpful and useful to you in your preparation for your message. All right. Questions on that? All right. So let's let's just briefly let me briefly go to the next uh the next step here and we'll have to pick this up uh next next week. After doing the re consulting the resources, then we're, we've done all of this study. We consulted resources, done all these things. Now we're ready to identify the exegetical, to state the exegetical idea of the passage. And if you remember, that's what we're aiming for. That's the whole purpose of our exegesis. We're trying to identify what did the original author intend for his audience to understand. That's the exegetical idea. It's not my sermon point it's the exegetical idea it's what the author the original author intended for his audience to understand 
Again, that's the goal of exegesis. And how we how we put that together was by basically identifying what we call the what, why, and how. That's the exegetical idea. So that is the, the what is the subject of the text. That's the author's main point. The why is the context of the text. In other words, why did the author make that point? And then the how is the outline of the text. Again, it's the author's flow of thought that we derive from the diagram. Okay? So, again, this is the aim for all of these steps, is to get us to the exegetical idea. It's the last step of the process. Okay? And again, remember, this is exegetical, not expositional. It's not your sermon main point and outline. This is the author's main point and outline. Now, obviously, they're going to be connected. But at this step, we're just looking at, okay, what did the author say? And why did he say it? And how did he explain it? What's his outline? And then later, we'll take that and adapt it to our sermon main point and outline that we call the, the homiletical idea. So, for example, we'll do this for 2 Timothy, and then we'll, we'll finish for today. So identifying the exegetical idea, what I did for 2 Timothy is basically the what is what, you know, summarizing this paragraph, essentially, the main point seems to be Paul challenges Timothy to fulfill his ministry and suffer for the gospel without shame. OK, that now there's more things in here, you know, the, the gift of God and the spirit of timidity. Power. There's other things, but I'm just trying to summarize that into one idea. Now, why? Why does Paul challenge Timothy to do that? Because God is not, has given him a spirit of power, love, and discipline. Sorry, I should say discipline, not cowardice, not timidity. So that, that's really the, the why of this. So again, you're looking at the passage. What's the main point? What's the point Paul's making? And then why is he making it? And again, for the why, just look for words like for. That gives us a reason, a because, or a so that. Okay? Now, the how, so that's the what. That's the main point. Paul challenges Timothy to fulfill his ministry, suffer for the gospel without shame. The why is because God has not given him a spirit of power. God has given him a spirit of power, love, and discipline, not cowardice, not timidity. Now, the how... We have to go back and look at the diagram of the passage. And from the diagram, we notice really three points. Third one's a little bit longer. Okay. But as we look at the out. The diagram, we see Paul makes a statement. That's his instruction to kindle afresh. Then he gives a reason. And then he gives sort of a, a result or an accompanying exhortation. All right. So I would see really sort of my outline, I would see three, three points here to this outline. So my first point, I would say Paul instructs Timothy to renew the ministry given to him by God. The second point is the basis for the instruction is the kind of spirit God has given. And then my third point would be Paul's exhortation that will enable Timothy to fulfill his ministry. Okay. And that really just comes from the diagram. So in this step, the what and the why, the what, you're just summarizing really the main point of the, the passage that you have. The why is, okay, what is the context here? Why does Paul give this exhortation, this instruction? And then the how is the really the outline, or which you can get from the diagram. Now, the main point, of course, is I remind you to kindle. Seven, and the these two are supporting points, but as I, I outline it, the supporting point, you'll, you'll note in how you explain how point two connects to point one and how point three connects to point two. But again, notice 
This is the exegetical idea. That's why I have Paul instructs Timothy. Paul's exhortation. Now, when I do the sermon outline, I'm not going to make it Paul and Timothy. I'm going to direct it to my hearers, right? But this is just the author's outline. Questions? I have a question, sir. Yes, go ahead. Based on that diagram, sir, the third main points is under the second main points. It is subordinating to verse 7, why yeah. it became our three, uh, third main points, the exhortation part. Well, it's a third outline point. All right. It's Paul's exhortation that will enable Timothy to fulfill his ministry. So it comes under the first point. But um, there's three distinct sections here in this passage, right? So all I'm doing is identifying each of those sections in the, as an outline point. So when I, uh, so in explaining the second point, for example, the basis for the instruction, I'll say, so the reason Paul gives this instruction to Timothy is because of, and that's my second point, the basis for the instruction. And then I say, Paul then also gives two commands that will enable Timothy to carry out his instruction to kindle afresh the gift of God. So in the explanation of these points, I'll explain how they fit under point one, but I'm not going to do, technically I could do this, right? Point one A, and then this is under A, you know, this could be B. You could do that and have a main idea of the, of the message and then two so but right now i'm just identifying sort of the the distinct sections within in the passage and there's three distinct sections here there's one main point and then these are subordinate as you said video but there's still yes, two there's still two distinct ideas that come under that main point So my points are, even if it is subordinating, we can make it as a top preaching point, separate well, top preaching point. This isn't a preaching point yet, so maybe it'd be better just to do it this way. All right. But what I'll do later is I will make, I will make them preaching points. Okay. Uh, Okay, sir, I understand. Yeah, and then later when we go to our sermon outline, I'll make these three distinct preaching points. But as I explain each point, I'll explain how they connect to each other. So we'll talk about that uh, next week, but that's a great question. You guys understand this question? Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, great question. Thank you. All right. Any any other so so for in in relation to your assignment then here, um what you'll do is put this is just the example. So on your assignment, you'll just identify the what, why, and the how. Okay. You just put down for your passage what is the main point why did the why did Paul make that point and then the outline of the text based on your diagram okay so that's all you need to do for the assignment okay final questions thoughts Comments? Any other questions maybe outside of this assignment?
related to another assignment related to the class or any anything? Okay, well, again, I've recorded this, so you'll have, uh, if you want to go back and review anything uh, on any of these assignments, you can go back. All of the recordings, or there are links on Canvas, or you can go directly to the YouTube channel, of course, and, and get it there, okay? Noor, it's good to, uh, good to see you're able to join us. You got your Wi-Fi back? Yes, it's very strong now. Thank you for your help, your prayer. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, okay, can five you days. close it? Sorry, go ahead. It was five days, no internet almost. Wow. Yeah. Well, can you close us in prayer then? Sure.